What's going on? Back again. Welcome aboard to episode six of the Q and A series. So, been really busy lately. That's why I haven't been posting much content. But I've been still been trying to post as much as possible, despite what I'm doing in the background on the back end. So, I'm basically working on a new coaching service, and I should be releasing it in August, September. But I'm not giving any particular dates. It's like every time I give a date, I start thinking of new ideas of how I could add more value to my package, and then it just goes. It gets postponed even more. So I'm not really going to give a particular date, but within the next few months, it should be ready. And I'm really going to be excited to be launching it to you guys. Another thing on this channel is I'm trying to make more female style related content because I check my analytics. It's 100% guys in the last 28 days. And I'm really trying to get that number up. It doesn't have to be necessarily like 50-50, but I want more females watching the videos. I want to reach a broader audience and I want to help more people out. And I feel like on this channel, yeah, I brought a couple women on, but it hasn't really been much. So I want to bring more females on, get more that style of content. And a lot of this content will still apply to men, but it's just you'll be looking at a female instead, as opposed to me just bringing on another guy on the channel. May even have some Q and A's with some females, whatever the case is. I'm just trying to make it more of a friendly channel for both genders, you know. And from a marketable standpoint, it just it seems more logical on my part, you know. So, be on the lookout for that. And I just want the comment sections to have more women. I want to have it more, more of a complete channel overall. You know, I don't want to just be one-dimensional. I don't want to be known as this trainer who's just coaching guys. You know, I want to also coach a lot of women. And people go by what they see. And if all they see is you know, videos of me training my neck, you know, bigger traps, you know, delts and all this kind of stuff, a lot of women don't want that kind of look. So it kind of scares certain people away. But I want it to be more friendly towards both genders. So that's what I'm working on. I have the coaching service I'm working on. I'm working on more content. And if you guys have any suggestions of like videos you'd like to see, let me know in the comment section down below. And once again, I'm dropping a video Q and A series every 14th and 28th of the month. Sometimes it's normal that I might be one day late. It's not the end of the world. But I'm roughly shooting for the middle of the month and the end of the month to give you guys at least one Q&A, so which adds up to two Q&As per month. So besides that, I hope you guys are doing well. Hope your projects are rolling. Hope your summer is starting to go well. And whatever the case is, you know, you guys want to talk, just message me in the comment section, hit me up in the DM, and that's pretty much it. So I've got some really good questions for today. We're gonna get it started. Okay, so the first question is from Iron John Maniac. He wants to know, what will be a great rep set scheme for compound movements during a volume day aside from dynamic effort? So this could be tackled in different ways. Well, I'll just give you guys a general basic guideline. You basically have your main lifts, you have your assistance exercises, then you have your accessories. It's kind of like a pyramid. And when you're designing a volume day or when you're following some kind of volume day, you could have a sort of setup where you could have, for example, the main lifts are say, let's say RDLs, incline benches, you know, chin-ups, uh, trap bar deadlifts, just big exercise like that. Assistance lifts might be like dumbbell presses, dumbbell rows, chest supported rows, Bulgarian split squats. And then the accessories might be exercise like hamstring curls, bicep work, tricep push down, stuff of that nature. So you could, for example, do at the beginning of your workout for your volume day, RDLs, let's say it's a lower body day, RDLs for three by 10. And then you could also have in the middle of there some Bulgarian split squats with dumbbells for three sets of 15. And then maybe later on in the workout, you could have some accessory exercise, like some hamstring curls for three sets of 20, or you know maybe some back extension, three sets of 20. So I personally like to vary the rep ranges, but I like to go higher in the rep ranges as I go further in on into the workout. So I hope that helps. So Lexi Samuel wants to know, are there any advantages to doing two variations in the same session, pause squats and touch and go squats in the same session, for example, over doing them in separate sessions instead? So this is really going to depend on your individualized goals. So for example, let's say you have performance related goals where you want to get very strong in a certain exercise, or maybe you're even a power lifter, you want to get stronger on the big three, or maybe you have more bodybuilding style goals where you're coming into a session you want to really hit the muscle from different kind of angles i know there's going to be a bit of overlap between the two but there's still factors to take into consideration so for example if i were like a bodybuilder and i have more of those hypertrophy goals i wouldn't necessarily want to have 
a touch and go squat and then right after that I do for example like a front squat because it's a bit too redundant for me but if for example you have more performance based goals the more specific the better so then you could benefit for example if you're trying to get a stronger squat off doing let's say a touch and go squat with maybe let's say a safety bar and then your secondary exercise of the day could be like a front squat done with the pause because it's very specific to your goals and your goals are to become a stronger squatter. So you're going to put more of the odds in your favor. And then you could do, for example, assistance exercises like split squat variations. You could do some posterior chain work, you know, some ab work, stuff of that nature. Whereas if we're talking more about, you know, bodybuilding, they would do more of like a safety bar squat and they would go maybe into like, you know, some hack squats, which is still a squatting variation. Maybe they might go into like some leg presses or exercises that are just a movement pattern that's relatively different overall so i hope that helps your question it really depends on the goals it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish here and i know you can't separate strength and size but obviously if you get stronger on exercise you are going to get a lot bigger but there's still a bit of differences between the two so i hope that helps so ke1994 asks is benching necessary or could you replace it with something like ring dips ring push-ups and yeah that's the question so I'm gonna say it depends on the goals. All the questions you guys are asking me, it really helps if you say what the exact goal is. Because if you just say, is this good or is this bad or whatever the case is, you're not really giving me much to work with. Like, what's the goal here? From the exercise that you're giving me, it sounds like you're coming more from the standpoint of calisthenics, you know, ring push-ups, ring dips, um, which is still gonna build a great chest, by the way, especially if you get stronger at them, you start adding weight. You know, progressive overload is overload. But what are we talking about here? You're trying to improve your bench press because if you're trying to improve your bench press, then the ring dips and the ring push-ups are not going to help you maximize that because it's not specific enough. So if you're just trying to build a bigger chest and maybe you train at home, you train in parks, whatever the case is, you can still do that off of the ring dip and the ring push-up. So in that case, the bench is not necessarily necessary, especially if you don't have access to it but it still would help. If you're trying to get the biggest chest possible, I would definitely recommend some kind of benching, at least like some dumbbell presses or whatever the case is, but you could still build a great chest with the lifts that you mentioned. So Pate underscore underscore says, are long farmer walks on your toes better for calf strength or size, or are they good at all? Would be a pretty easy and time-saving way of training calves. This is actually what my coach, uh, Connor Harris, you guys could check him out. I've done a couple of Q&As with him. This is what he recommended for a protocol for these foot issues I was going through where I had my foot flaring out to the side and I still go through it till this day it's not completely sorted out but he actually programmed something called the Russian farmer walk which is a farmer walk where you're doing it on your tippy toes and it's not only good for calf hypertrophy but it's great for strengthening the foot and I would like these for sets of three minutes at least so you could do like three sets of three minutes and that's kind of like your GBP so it's not really gonna hit your traps too hard but as far as like your calves definitely going to hypertrophy them. My calves have gotten a lot bigger. You can also check out my calf video I just dropped. They're definitely bigger than the last time I posted a calf video. But from a GBP standpoint, they're great as well. You know, for athleticism, for gait, it's really a bang for your buck exercise. And you could get way more out of lighter loads than a regular farmer walk. You can grab, you know, some dumbbells and you just go for walks on your tippy toes. And it's really going to strengthen your feet as well. So hope that helps. GLG brother asks, what is more important Intensity, so heavy weights and high effort, or volume. So there's been a lot of controversy with regarding this question, but to answer your question with another question is what are you talking about when you say volume? Because volume is different from me to you. So it's all relative at the end of the day. So the question is not specific enough altogether. But what I will say is that there's a lot of junk volume in a lot of people's programs that probably doesn't really make a big difference in the results anyway. So it really comes down to quality. And if we're talking about heavy weights with high effort, then that's going to be a lot more taxing than you think if you're actually taking those sets to a relatively high RPE. So I would say that as long as you're progressing in weights, as long as you're getting stronger week after week, you could keep the volume on the slightly lower side because it is going to be more taxing on the body and you don't want to have too much junk volume, but you have to find that sweet spot for you because you don't want to do too little volume either. So you have to find what works for you as vague as that sounds. But if you, got, you want me to be a bit more specific, you could send me on my DMs what your program looks like and then I could give you a lot more information from there.
So Strength Hacks Coaching wants to know what's your favorite grip exercises? Also, what are your top tips for better sleep quality? So just two questions, but I'll still answer it. For a grip, I would definitely go with a farmer walk. And you could also do, if you're really desperate for grip strength, you could do farmer walks with fat grips on them. You could use two inch, two and a half, three inch, and those will definitely hammer your grip strength. And for the second question, what are your top tips for better sleep quality? I would definitely say you have to have a certain standard of sleep to get. So for myself, I used to train early in the morning and I kind of stopped doing that because I'm not getting enough sleep. So I don't care about, I read this post on Twitter the other day. Someone said, I don't care about your four or 5 a.m. workout if you're getting four or five hours of sleep. And that's kind of like how you get better quality sleep. Just set a standard for yourself. Tell yourself, okay, look, I'm going to get eight hours a night and that's, there's no negotiation. So it may seem like you're getting you know, less work done throughout the day because you're sleeping eight hours where it's like it does feel kind of empowering sometimes where you sleep six hours and you feel energetic. But from a long-term perspective, it's not going to work out for you. It's just for most people, it doesn't work out, especially for lifters because we need that extra sleep. We need that extra recovery. So I would just sleep for, shoot for eight hours. Another thing that helps is trying to go to bed same time every day, waking up the same time. That tends to help a lot as well. And as far as another thing I'll add in for better sleep quality, it's sleeping in pitch black. So it really helps when you have curtains that are covering your whole window and you don't have any lights on, you don't have any like, you know, alarm clocks with lights shooting in your face or like your phone is just on with the screen. There's also certain apps you could set your phone to where it turns the light lower. It dims the light every hour closer to your bedtime. So that helps too. It helps you get better quality sleep. Just minimizing as much light as possible. What I like to do too when I actually just started doing this is just, you know, reading for like 10, 15 minutes before I go to sleep. It's not much, but at least it's better than going in front of a screen for 10, 15 minutes. This will relax you a bit more and you'll get better quality sleep. So hope that helps. So Matt C says, thoughts on trap bar penley rows and inverted ring face pulls. So for the trap bar penley rows, it depends what your goals are. I look at the trap bar penley row as more of an exercise for people who really want to increase their deadlift because it's very specific. They're in a very similar position. Or more so, should I say, increase their trap bar deadlift because it's very specific to that exercise implement. And if we're talking about more bodybuilding goals, I think for bodybuilders, I'm not really a big fan of penlays. I like to really keep the tension in the muscle. But I know there's contradicting thoughts on that. But I've just found from my personal experience that my back gets much bigger when I'm doing my rolls without touching the ground as opposed to if I'm doing like pen lay rows because it's just resting at the bottom but it does tend to be better for you know pulling performance so if you're trying to improve your deadlift variations it's obviously easier on the lower back as well when you're doing the pen lay style so you have to kind of ask yourself what the goal is here but as far as the trap bar pen lay row I think it's a good exercise for people who really want to increase the trap bar deadlift performance and as far as the inverted ring face pulls it's a good exercise for people who are into calisthenics, you know, people who want to improve their face pull strength, but they don't have access to maybe like a cable station. So they want to do it with their body weight. That's perfectly fine too. But if we're talking about the face pull and you want to increase, you know, your rear delt growth, me, I personally like to take, you know, the core out of it. I want to isolate my rear delts and I could use my core for other exercises that are more specific. Like I could do, you know, unilateral farmer walks. I want to strengthen my core, but if I'm training my rear delts, if I'm doing my face pull, I don't have to do, I don't have to get my core involved personally because it's not part of my goals. So I'm focused solely on the rear delts. So I would do, for example, like a half kneeling rear delt um, face pull, like I did in my shoulder video. Because when you do it like that, it takes a lot of the core out of it and you could focus solely on, you know, pulling back and it just minimizes other muscle groups getting involved. So. So Adrian Molina wants to know best training tips for people who work manual labor but still want to put on mass. So this is going to depend on what, what kind of manual labor we're talking about here. Are you talking about mowing lawns? Because that's not as stressful as doing something like a construction job. Or let's say you're a mover where you're moving pianos and uh, refrigerators from point A to point B. That's definitely going to be harder on recovery, harder on you know, your CNS and your erectors and stuff of that nature as opposed to doing easier jobs. So you have to take that into account. How many hours a week are you doing? So once you have all these factors into play, and once you actually know exactly how much you want to weigh, so you have like a concrete number, let's say you weigh, you know, 180, you want to get to 200, you want to put on 20 pounds, you have to plug that into your TDEE. So you go on like my fitness pal, and you could calculate how many calories you should be burning a day off these manual labor jobs. 
and then from there you can make up for the lost calories another thing on your gbp and your training is if you're doing enough manual labor you may not even need to do any gbp in your training because you're doing so much throughout the week if you're doing 40 hours a week of just manual labor you probably don't even need any conditioning in your routine because you're doing so much in your day-to-day -day job so that's just another factor to come into play you might need slightly less volume when you go into the gym especially from a conditioning standpoint and since you know you may be tired, you may need extra naps, you may need like an extra hour of sleep, you may need to bring that seven hours to like eight and a half. And you might have to make certain modifications to your lifestyle and your nutrition because you will be burning a lot of calories. But if you have any more questions, let me know in my DMs and hope that helps. So Bryce D wants to know, hey Phil, love your content. Besides diet being on point, is it better to do body weight ab exercises every day or weighted ab exercises two out of three times per week to make hypertrophy gains for abs and obliques? Thanks. So to answer your first question, besides the diet being on point, the diet is extremely important, but I still believe in direct ab work if you want to hypertrophy your abs and your obliques because it's like any other muscle group. And another thing regarding hypertrophy gains for abs and obliques is a lot of people make the mistake of just doing isometrics. And isometrics are definitely effective, but if I told you guys that to get the biggest chest possible, all you have to do is just grab a pec deck and just hold it in this position, that wouldn't be the best advice. That's like me telling you, hey, just do planks for your abs. You still need to have some uh, shortening and some lengthening of the muscle. So you could benefit, for example, for ab training to do like some decline sit-ups. You could uh, benefit from doing from, from the standpoint of obliques, like some lateral flexion, you know, so some lateral crunches. And you could eventually add weights into the mix. It could be with a uh, weight vest. It could be with holding a plate in your hands. You could still should still apply progressive overload and I would actually recommend slightly higher reps because the range of motions tends to be very small especially if you're doing it properly but to answer your question I like a lot of body weight type exercises for the abs for hypertrophy them you know I like hanging leg raises I like decline sit-ups stuff of that nature uh, you could even do like side bends or you know some lateral flexion work um, but with that being said there's still a place for isometrics in your training you know but I personally don't find they're gonna hypertrophy your abs as much as doing lifts that actually have some shortening and some lengthening in them so Ian Lee wants to know I'm seeming to always stall on weighted chin-ups I'm running three sets of three to five and I am a novice lifter what are some ways to continue to progress I'm progressing well in all my other lifts so I don't think rest and diet is an issue also should I do total weighted chin-ups so body weight plus weight or should I just try to progress with the weight Thanks, Phil. So there's several different ways you can improve your weighted chin up. But what I would recommend is you have one day where you do lower reps and one day where you do higher reps. You can even add like a middle day into the mix as well. So you said you're a novice lifter. So you're most likely running a full body routine. So you're most likely in the gym three days per week. So you could simply have if you're getting a stronger weighted chin up is really a priority for you. You could have a weighted chin up early on in your workout. for Let's say three to five reps three sets of five reps on day one. Middle of the week, you could have, for example, you know, some inverted rows for higher reps. And at the end of the week, you could have some higher reps on your chin-ups. And if you're not strong enough to do higher reps, you could do them band assisted. But you wanna hit different rep ranges and you wanna get stronger at different rep ranges. And you wanna get stronger at exercises that are gonna help carry over to that. So something like getting stronger at your inverted rows, you're getting stronger at you know, different forms of pulling variations, you know, one arm rows. Uh, getting, you know, doing your hanging leg raises. There's a lot of exercises that are actually going to help you with the exercise without doing that exact exercise. But at the end of the day, specificity is still king. So you want to still make sure you're doing the lift at least twice a week. And that's where you have the lower reps in the mix. Later on, you have the higher reps. So it's just a whole system altogether. And if you're wondering more of the details, I have a video I'll show you guys right here how to get a stronger weighted chin up. It could be weighted pull up. But I give you guys a step-by-step -step approach on how I was weighing around 210 and I got a two plate pull up for reps. So just to refer you guys to that video and hope that helps. All right, so there you guys have it. That wraps up the Q and A. Those are the questions for this week. So let me know for the following week, or should I say the 28th of June, what you want to be answered and I'll definitely deliver that to you guys. So hope you guys have a good rest of the day. Look out for some future content, especially some female related content. Let me know what more videos you want to see. If you guys have any more video ideas, I'll definitely write them down. And with that being said, hope you guys have a good rest of the week and be on the lookout for some new content. Next